lot of work with law enforcement, interview and interrogation. You wrote a book about that? Uh, yeah. Law enforcement being able to get the truth out of people? Yeah. You know, in 1997, I wrote a book called uh, Never Be Lied To Again. It was the first book on lie detection for the general public. Went on to become a New York Times bestseller. Sold millions of copies in 31 languages. Michael Floyd, former officer at the CIA and NSA, endorsing your book here. Yeah. Which is pretty fascinating. He's a great guy. FBI to Shadokim, which is very, you know, very similar yeah. nowadays. Yeah. Because you get a resume, you got to turn to the FBI. We give a lot of dating classes. Yeah, sure. The job of the first date, tell people, is just to get to a second date. Focus on making the other person feel good. Because imagine if both people did that, they both come across great. But when you're eye focused, you're going to be self conscious first off, right? Whether it's a speech or on a date, you focus on the self, you're literally conscious of the self. Every gesture you make, you don't even know what to do with your hands, every word, you can analyze it, you can have that narrative going in the background. Oh, I just said that. I wonder if she picked up on that. No, that's that. Forget about that. Just your only voter, your only job is to help that other person have a great time and to focus on them. Afterwards, you can decide if they were right for you. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Meaningful People podcast. Nachi Gordon here. I'm so excited to present this episode to you. We sat down with Dr. David Lieberman. Now, you might be thinking, who is Dr. David Lieberman? Well, Dr. David Lieberman is a psychotherapist, and he's an internationally recognized leader in the field of human behaviors and interpersonal relationships. He has nine books. It has been translated into 27 languages and sold millions and millions of copies. Uh, maybe you know some of his books, uh, Never Be Lied To Again, Never Get Angry Again, Mind Reader, Make Peace With Anyone. He has a book, uh, Free Will Works. So Dr. Lieberman, you may have seen him speak. He speaks a lot about dating in Shaduchim, and he drops some serious advice for those in Shaduchim. Um, what that first date should look like. For years, Dr. Lieberman has counseled and given advice to top FBI agents on how to interrogate and how to get the truth out of people. So this episode is all about our relationships with each other, maybe with a spouse, with your kids, plus so much more. So listen big. This is Dr. Dave. He's an amazing person. And I'm curious if you have advice, if you have something in your mind of like, well, this is what I do. And you want Dr. Lieberman to answer about like, this is my situation. How can I deal with this? Dr. Lieberman, this person lies like this. If this person tips their nose, is that lying? Go ahead, leave it in the comments, leave a comment on this video, and you'll be entered to win Dr. Lieberman's newest book, and we will try to get him to answer as many of your questions as possible. Of course, this episode is sponsored by our friends at Alpert and Associates. You know, so many of you have called Moshe Alpert over the last couple of weeks, and what I like to hear is many of you are taking this seriously. Finances is not, it's not the time to say, yeah, I'm just going to make a phone call and, and hear it out, but it's, I'm going to put it on the back burner for a few months. Invest in yourself, invest in your, in your finances, not like literally like invest in it, but also literally invest in it. But I'm saying, take it seriously. You know, Barksham, I just had a, another baby girl and uh, not too long ago. And, and something that I'm dealing with Moshe Alpert is opening up a bank account for her, making sure that there's money going there every single month, because that's awesome. Because when that girl's older and 18, 19, she'll be like, oh, wow, I'm glad my parents did this for me. And you can do that for your kids. You can do a lot more than that. So make sure you call Moshe Alpert today at 718-644-1594. Email him today at albertmoshe at gmail.com. Set up those appointments and it's time to take control of your finances. Make sure you're spending responsibly. Maybe you're in seminary. Maybe you're in yeshiva. You're coming back. Maybe you have a daughter in seminary and you're like, yeah, they're going to come back. They're going to start dating. They're going to get married, but they have, don't know the first thing when it comes to finances because you've been paying their bill the last year. Set them up with a plan. Set them up with Moshe Alpert, and that will be one of the best decisions you've ever made. Enjoy this episode, everybody. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. We're being joined here by Dr. David Lieberman. Thank you for, for uh, sitting down, making the track, coming here. Um, I've, I've been listening and watching your talks for such a long time. It's really, it's been a long time. I remember, you know, uh, it's, it's actually probably the, what, four or five year anniversary of me meeting you for the first time. I was by the go to convention as a young 21 year old, um, probably 15, 20 pounds lesser than I am right now. Um, and I don't know why I had, I don't know why I felt the need to say that. I guess I'm insecure. Anyways, moving on. I feel like when I'm sitting across a therapist, I just like, 
Yeah. Um, Get in and, that head. And I met you for the first time. And I, have a, I actually have a picture of it. Someone took a picture. We, we were talking, but I was like in the beginning infancy stages of me starting Meaningful Men and everything. So at the Crown Hotel? Yeah, by Crown the Plaza. Gazebo. Yeah. Yes, you remember too. Sure, sure, Must sure. have been memorable for you also. <laughs> <laughs> Made a good first impression. Was you it the did. handshake? <laughs> you did, you did, you did. Yeah, no, sure. I remember the conversation well. Yeah, but I, I remember sitting and just listening to, to your talks. And you have a very... Um, a very um, just cool way of explaining complicated terms in simple ways. I remember one pace like I was sitting down after one of the talks you gave it was me, Rabbi Ari Ben Shushan, his wife, my wife, and you were talking about the difference between a psychopath and something else. When we were sociopath, like, sociopath. Yeah, we were like, wow, like that's amazing. You have a lot of knowledge, but I want to you know peel it back. A lot of people listen to your stuff. What is the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath? Right. It's a good question. So there are different Boom, theories. Boom, goes. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> but Lamaisa is that bottom line is that a sociopath is somebody who the wiring is sort of that way in the brain. But if it's not an environmental trigger, a person doesn't grow up in a certain way, you're chaotic or abusive then uh, childhood, then it will remain sort of uh, fixed wiring without that fuse being lit. A psychopath and they're both under the umbrella of what's called antisocial personality disorder. A psychopath is somebody, no matter what happens, no matter what kind of environment, it could be the most loving, caring. Unfortunately, they're going to um, they're going to exhibit signs and symptoms of psychopathy, and they will very well be a psychopath. And what they are, both of them, is somebody who does not have a conscience. And it is so unconscionable for us, also given you know what's going on now in Israel, to understand. See, it makes us feel better when we can think that there's just, you know, misunderstood or or bad people or, you know, they just don't understand. There is what to say for somebody who lacks a conscience, meaning they know right from wrong, but they don't care. It's not about not being clear, being fuzzy. That's somebody who's psychotic, right? And there's somebody who's psychotic, suffers with psychosis. They don't know. They don't have clarity on reality, unfortunately. But that is quite different from a psychopath, a sociopath. Those people see reality clearly, know right from wrong, they choose and evil. ignore it. Exactly. They choose evil. So would you say- the simcha. Yeah. Would you say that these these Hamas fight, these people, these terrorists are psychopaths? That's a good question. So I, I think the conditioning is so inbred. Think about this, by the way. If you grow up, being told by the time you you could you could walk and talk that Israelis are evil and it's our job to kill it all blah 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 you know you can take the most seemingly sane person and confuse their moral compass. Having said that, there are some no doubt who are definition of evil, but I do think that the masses are simply just indoctr indoctrinated with uh, an ideology that corrupts their ability to see clearly. Shout out to the UN and UNRWA. Thank you for teaching these people like so well. It's unbelievable. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, exactly. So, uh, you know, before we get into all these things, you've written several books, some of which I've read. And I'm, oh, not, I'm not a big reader. Reminds me. I, yeah. I brought presents for you guys. I brought oh, two nice. books. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Hanukkah yeah. presents. Amazing. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much. But I, I read your book on-, on Two books there. Mind Reader and Never Getting Re Again, I think. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Nissen passed me. The Mind Reader one is like, the whole concept to me is, Thank I have Mind Reader. Thank you. Oh, do you? Okay. Yes, then. Yeah, Momo, I'll give you mind reader. Never get angry, get angry sound, sounds good. But this is brilliant. This oh, is brilliant. Design. Yeah, That's awesome. Yeah, 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 oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> this looks like some of the books in my house <laughs> <laughs> with young children. Very good. It's it's a very uh, sophisticated cover. For anyone yeah. that can't see, it's the cover yeah, we'll put it on the is thing. scribbled. That's amazing. Did you do it yourself? Did you scribble it? Or? <laughs> no, it's a design. You yeah. tell the designer, just make it look really good and then just scribble all over it. <laughs> like that's what you told them. I want to ask you, um, just take us back. A lot of people listen to your stuff and know about you and read your books, but maybe they don't know so much about David Lieberman. Where'd you grow up? You know, what was your family dynamic, dynamic like? What was your childhood like? Uh, so fairly typical. If there's such a thing as ultra orthodox, we grew up like ultra reformed. Oh, you nice. know, there was a wall to the left of us. I mean, that's how, you know, unaffiliated we were. We didn't have nothing to do with those, you know, religious zealots that went to the reform temple. We were really unaffiliated <laughs> um, in an area that was probably 90% Jewish and at the time, 0% from. Where's that? Roslyn. Roslyn, New York. Yeah, Long Island. It's like one of those stops in LAR. Yeah, yeah. Roslyn. Yeah, today it's, I think there's a Chabad. Actually, I know that there's a Chabad there and there's shuls and it's- My it's, daughter's name is Rosalind. Really? Yeah. Rosalind. Oh, Rosalind. No, no, I'm saying, is your daughter's name as a D at the end? Nope. <laughs> nope. No D. No you D. lived in Rosalind. Rosalind with an N. There was Rosalind. a big uh, football coach uh, scandal, if I remember correctly. In Rosalind? 
right? You start off any sentence with anything to do with, I got football or basketball. <laughs> Usually this no, is not his no, domain. You're not, I'm like no out of my sports? comfort zone here. No, never. Nothing? Never got You think in. a guy who grew up in a small town. I went out on a limb a small for town. a football reference. Rosin's on a small, small, small town? I don't know. Back 50 years ago, everything was a small town, but I don't know. Yeah. Do okay. you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, 100%. Okay. What, what, no, what the scandal? scandal? No, I don't actually. Okay. What was the scandal? I don't know. It was some kind of scandal that I don't have a lot of details about. I was kind of hoping I would just throw the reference out and then the details would sort of emerge. I don't have the details so, well uh, enough to actually supply like them. Like the menorah just comes out. Uh, yeah. 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 It's not with a Rosalind, right? Rosalind, yeah. Yes, it is my daughter's name. Rosalind. Okay. All right. Rosie. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. Okay, look at that. Close parenthesis. We found, we found our, we found our themes. Um, anyway, so yeah, what was it? So you weren't, you weren't religious. We're not religious, no. And then um, fast forward, I was about uh, 29, 28, 29. And my brother, I have a twin brother who went, he's brilliant, by the way. Adam? Yeah. I know you guys are twins, but I've heard him speak yeah. also. He is brilliant. He, but I know it sounds self-serving when I say he's my twin, that he's brilliant. But, you know, <laughs> it's like, he's also uh, extremely good looking. He's my he, twin, identical by Identical <laughs> twins. No, they're not identical, it happens to be, no? You're not. No, he's like six yeah. two and uh, we, we don't look, we look similar. You guys really didn't grow up orthodox. <laughs> Why is that? Six, six foot oh, two? Six, six, like, that's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got vitamin D. <laughs> I don't know what that means. So yeah, you're 24 fast already, 29. Yeah, 29. And my brother goes to this uh, discovery seminar and uh, he was blown away by it. And those who don't know, discovery is, uh, I don't know if they still have the seminars, but you're familiar with discovery at all? It was uh, sort of like the codes and the Torah and- um, Okay, who gave it? Who so it was, it was a good question. I wish I knew who, uh, I mean, Asia Torah was the ones who were giving the seminars and there were a couple different sort of teams, you know, A team, B team, those folks like that. It used to be a week, then they reduced it down to a couple of days, and then it became, I think, just a one day seminar. He was blown away by it. Mama, she was just blown away. And so I meet him, and he's like, You know, you got to check this stuff out. And I'm like, ah, Whatever. So I go You're down. single at this point? You're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 29. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 29. I was uh, very successful by, you know, traditional metrics in the secular world. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I go down to a class taught by Steve Eisenberg, who's a lovely, amazing guy. Uh, He's not a rabbi, but very learned and just uh, an extraordinary person. And I remember just being, wow, blown away. And our exposure was you know, certainly very limited. And it was on the Parsha. And, uh, and that was it. And then little by little by little, you know, next thing you know, you're ripping toilet paper two hours, you know. <laughs> time is, time is for Kia. You know, that's, that's a funny story. <laughs> that's funny. It's a great muscle. <laughs> little by little, little yeah. toilet paper, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't like I was looking, you know, for the meaning of life, backpacking across Europe. You were just working. You were doing your- you I was doing my thing. Again, I was, I was uh, yeah, living in Manhattan at the time. And um, so it was, I wasn't looking to, you know, upend anything to the contrary. I fought tooth and nail. And, you know, every Shabbos table, you know, the amazing, you know, uh, Ash rabbis and Rebbitsons, was fought with a lot of, you know, questions. Intellectual Because you're an, yeah, you're an intellectual. Sure. So that, that's what you, you know. I like to consider my, uh, yeah, I'm not, you know, the, it, some people are more drawn by the, you know, the two hour guitar of Della. Yeah. You know, that's not my thing. Yeah. Right. So that didn't, yeah. that, that wasn't, that, that wasn't, wasn't the thing. Approach. It was just, uh, I was like, wow. Because I was already writing at the time. I'd written, uh, I got two books and, um, Obviously, what I do is, is is psychology based, and so on the tour, it is just so. I was like, wow, this is one stop shopping for stealing stuff. I mean, this is this is good stuff here. <laughs> so that's what really attracted me to. It. I was like, wow, look at this, and uh, yeah, it was just fascinating. So then you just like became religious. It was over a period of, I guess, uh, I got married when I was thirty five. Okay. To a typical Beis Yaakov girl, amazing girl. Yeah. She was from from birth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 unique. I'd say rare. It is, and now one would say right, but because you know, however, Shem has it. She had to wait for her, you know, Ziva yeah. to get his act together. <laughs> um, but yeah, just curious. Uh, you know, just yeah, she was thirty when we got married. Incredible. But by that time, you had already taken on Yiddishkeit. Yeah, I, I would say she had no business marrying me. I was, you know, I was <laughs> pretty solid. Um, you know, maybe you know, a couple kinks needed to be worked out still, but you know, maybe she saw a, uh, you know, a, she saw immense potential. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd say diamond in the rough, but I, what's that fake diamond called? Uh, um, lab grenade. No, no. right? Yeah. 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 It was a zirconian. Yeah. There's a conian diamond in the rough. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. 
That's so interesting. But but it seems like prior to you even have, going down the religious path, you went to schooling. You were all in on on psychology. What I mean, what spoke to you about that? And and like, you, you know, I guess you you delved in there full force. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I've always been fascinated by human nature ever since I can remember. Uh, I was just fascinated by people and why we do the things that we do. I mean, you guys, obviously, you have a very successful podcast. You have Thank a you. natural curiosity. You want to learn about people. Um, and there's no difference uh, with me. I was just fascinated. Well, there's a big difference because you really need to know why the brain kind of does what it does and says what it says. I kind of ask people what they have <laughs> like having for dinner, you know, it's a you know, big difference. And you need your credentials are far different than mine. Um, but still, what drives it is both, you know, it's an interest, curiosity. It's curiosity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you look at anyone who's successful. I'm speaking with somebody. I'm trying to remember the context. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, I was doing an interview and he was just really good. And I told him, I said, you know what? You are just, he goes, I'm, I'm asking only questions that I'm curious about myself. I thought it was just, wow, that's, you know, when you have a natural curiosity for something, you're going to be driven toward it. I really, I like, I, I would like to do that here. Ask things that I'm curious about. Yeah, dude. It's a good idea. You're going to be asking where the guy got his shoes or what? what where what? did you get your shoes? Do you know, Suit Central? Actually, I do. No, my son bought them. And, Kohan, um, right? I have, I have no idea. Oh. <laughs> I have, I have no idea. <laughs> but they're the wrong size. So I was like, okay, I'll take them. See, I would have never known that. They were the wrong know. size for him. Yeah, they're also the wrong size for me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because that happens to me. I go into a shoe store and I'm like, oh, could I see this in a 10? And the guy's like, oh, I have this in a nine and a half or, or an 11. I'm like, I can't negotiate my shoe size. <laughs> it's like, yeah. this is not a negotiation. Yeah, but you know, we're doing I have no wiggle room. Yeah. The toe, does it really need to be not so far from the front? You know, it's those tailors who are like insisting that it looks good when, you know, you feel like Herman Munster, you know, it comes <laughs> up to here. You can't walk and go, it's beautiful, beautiful, tailor, <laughs> beautiful. It's like, really? How, how different would you say your, um, your upbringing and up until you became religious was your life. I mean, many times we speak to people who, who make that change at a younger age, yeah. um, but you were, I guess, you know, pretty well into adulthood when you made such a, this, this change, which sure. I imagine is more difficult. So I had a, I'm, I'm so grateful for many just, you know, brachas and, and the advantages along the way. One is my career. There's some people whose career don't lend themselves to Yiddishkeit, you know, which they're fast to discover once they become from. Uh, whereas being an author is, and I've written in mainstream, like, you know, it's Random House, St. Martin's Press, these books. I also write books with Feldheim. So I'm able to, you know, branch out into other audiences um, and do what I want to do and certainly speak. Topics are different. You know, when I speak on in the secular world or the, you know, mainstream world is, is much, much different than I speak on in the Jewish world. What would you kind of speak in, in the non-Jewish world about? So, so it varies a lot. I do. I don't speak so often publicly about it, but I, 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 I guess I'm starting to now. I do a lot of work with law enforcement, interview and interrogation. Um, so uh, I you see, wrote a book about that. Yeah, I wrote. I read, uh, I wrote a couple of books um, on that theme. But yeah, about law enforcement being able to get the truth out of people. Yeah, you have someone, Michael Floyd, former officer at the CIA and NSA, endorsing your book here. Yeah pretty fascinating great guy <laughs> uh so i do a lot of work in um in government law enforcement and also in non-government uh, but in the areas of lie detection for companies like fraud detection things like that that is fascinating you can tell you like would you comfortably say that you'll be able to look at someone in a conversation and be like they're lying um in every conversation no but given enough time typically I'm sure people love having you over for Shabbos. <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't bad enough, I read books then I had to yeah, understand people. Now it's how to detect deception. Yeah. There was a, there was a show not long ago, I think. Uh, Lie, Lie to me. me. Yeah. Lie Do to me. Dr. Lightman yes. was the name. You know that show? The show about. I've, I've heard of it. Yeah. Where they just figure out when people are lying. I, I just found it fascinating. Right. So, so if I remember right, that was based on the work of a guy by the name of Paul Ekman okay. and something called micro expressions. Um, yeah, like a, like a, the nose crinkles a little bit. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Which, uh, you know, like a lot of things in every discipline and, and uh, uh, lie detection is, is certainly no different. There's different camps. Some say it's brilliant. It's fantastic. Others say, come on, you know, but um, there's this. Right. And Suits is, is a wildly unrealistic portrayal of the practice of law as well. Yeah. 
That's true. I, I I know if it's unrealistic, but I'm I imagine you know that it is. So what, what are, I'm, I'm just, I, I happen to be, are you fascinated by, it? I'm fascinated by the whole concept of being able to talk to somebody. Cause a lot of times I'll talk to someone and be like, there's no way that's true. Yeah. But, yeah. but there's also no way for me to know that. What are some things that you can see in somebody that say, mm, that's not really the truth without reading the entire book. Right. Uh, so, so first off, it, it depends in terms of, well, I'll tell you what doesn't work. Yeah. I'll tell you what doesn't work. I actually just gave a talk for an organization called the ACFE Association for Certified Fraud Examiners. It was in Seattle, 100,000 people, no, excuse me, the organization of 100,000 people, there's a few thousand people there at the uh, convention center. And is it, it's funny story, it's one of the keynotes. Now, I'm obviously from guy wearing a yarmulke and, and I've got to go on stage and it's a five day convention. And I looking at the brochure and it's filled with all people giving, you know, concurrent sessions on stuff I'm about to debunk. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to forget about it. I mean, I mean, this is, this is a problem. They're going to be sitting there. They're going to be, I was the first day of five, the, you know, a five day uh, convention. And, and you're preemptively debunking. I'm preemptively. And I'm thinking this is, this is, this is so. It's very provocative. It, yeah, but I, I, it's not what I want to do. It's certainly not, you know, Kiddush Hashem. So um, I went on and I, I the first, I, you know, I told a little joke and tried to warm up these audience of, you know, 5,000 people sitting there like this, you know. <laughs> um, and, and actually terrific, I should say, really terrific, terrific organization and, and, and great crowd. But obviously you have a dilemma because you don't want to get up there and uh, under any condition and, you know, make... I've been on panels and talks where, you know, the person says something diametrically opposed to what I want to say. And it's a problem, but certainly here, you know, an obvious problem being, being from and people thinking, oh, you know, what a, you know, un unpleasant fella. So I got up and I said, you know, in 1997, I wrote a book called uh, Never Be Lied To Again. It was the first book on lie detection for the general public, went on to become a New York Times bestseller, sold millions of copies in 31 languages. There's only one problem. I got a lot of it wrong. What I'd like to share with you is what I got wrong and why. Ah, so now you completely just disarm them because I'm not coming in with a, you know, I know it all. They're like, wow, what'd you get wrong? And then, you know, I spent two minutes on that because that's what it was. <laughs> and then I went into, so here's what, you know, the research. And then so, so to answer your question is what doesn't work really is body language. Because there's, there, there, I mean, it, 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 there's, even though you're asking a very good basic question, there's layers and layers and layers. And there's what's called guarded conversations and unguarded conversations. But we all know, right, that, you know, the person who's got their arm crossed means what? You know, maybe defensive, maybe, uh, you know, standoffish, a uh, person scratching their nose. Now, I'm going to, if I want to lie to you, maybe I'll look you directly in the eye. I'll be emphatic with my gestures. I will, you know, be very passionate. But we all know to avoid doing those things that are going to give ourselves away. So unless you've got a five-year-old who's got his hand caught in the cookie jar, you really need more sophisticated techniques. So, you know, when you're talking to somebody and, you know, they do this because they're feeling defensive, but they're not necessarily lying. And this for a long time was a classic uh, sign of lie detection is, is arms folded. And it, it doesn't mean anything other than they're folding their arms. They could be cold. They could be comfortable. So that's your debunking be right now. You're debunking the arm folding thing. Uh, yes. In what's called, again, guarded conversations. In unguarded conversations, meaning you're observing somebody who doesn't know that they're being watched, then you have a whole other uh, sort of chachma called embodied cognition, which basically says is that the body is going to act congruently with what we're thinking. So if in fact the person is sitting with their you know uh, shoulders down or they're hunched over, you can be fairly sure that they may be feeling a little nervous, a little bit anxious. If they're sitting up, you know, shoulders back, they're feeling like this, they may be uh, trying to convince you that they're confident again, but that would be in guarded conversations. In unguarded conversations, it's quite possibly that they are feeling much more confident. Who's it, super yeah. conscious of how they're sitting right now? <laughs> Me. Yeah. Yeah. That's so As you're describing, like is the different guard, postures. Is, is this a guarded right. conversation, though? I don't know. What's that? Sorry. Is this a guarded conversation? For sure. Yeah. When you've got two cameras on you, <laughs> you can assume it's a guarded conversation. Oh, for the cameras sure. are here. I forgot. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. Hundred percent. Um, that's really interesting. So you do work with law enforcement on being able to detect these things. It's, these, yeah. these, they actually train to know this. They don't just guess. No, there's some people I remember, I'll tell you a frightening conversation, which I had with at then was the director of the behavioral science unit that houses the profilers of the FBI. We're going back a number of years. And, uh, I mean, I remember his name. I'm just not going to say it again, a, a terrific guy. 
Um, and classified information. Yeah. Um, I don't like, you know, outing people, particularly, you know, once they retire, they I love it. try to, you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, he said, what's frightening now is that the people coming up, uh, you know, into the bureau and in different branches, they've lost the ability for just basic observation and basic skills to detect deception because their whole world is this, mm -hmm. is anyone listening and not watching, it's, you know, thumbs and texting and that's their communication. So just basic, uh, just observation and uh, basic interactions and communication is something that all has to be taught. And certainly it's intuitive to some. Some people can be taught into the blue in the face and they're just bad. Other people, they just have that, you know, that hush, they, they have that uh, sensitivity to it. Interesting, you know, transition from FBI to Shaduchim, which is very, you know, very similar yeah. nowadays. Yeah. Because you get a resume, you got to turn in the FBI. You speak a lot about, you give a lot of dating classes. Yeah, sure. Um, well, first question is why? Right. So I, I speak on what I think I can get the most bang for my buck, meaning what I think I have the greatest contribution in. There are plenty of people who speak on amazing subjects that are just outside of my wheelhouse. When I get calls for that, you know, hey, you know what, can you, uh, you know, motivate the sales thing? I was like, you know what, could I? Yeah. Go I'm, sell stuff, guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not your guy. I'm not the, you know. Tony the, Robbins. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not that. And, 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 and we all know some great, you know, people in our world who are at the mass, you know, master of that. Um, and I say, you know, call, call them. You know, it's, it's, it's not my wheelhouse. So I speak on Shaduchim, I speak on Chinuch, and I speak on Shalom Bias. I think, you know, in, in relationships, you're going to get the most bang for your buck because, and I'll, I, I, you know, having done this for a very, very long time, I found that the quality of our relationships and the quality of our emotional health is interwoven. So if you can help people to optimize their relationships, you know, with their parents, you know, with their children, with their siblings, and or be able to date effectively. Sometimes you've got great guys, great girls, but they are just not good communicators. So if you're able to get them to be more effective, then you, you mommy should you change their lives. Mm -hmm. So that's why I speak uh, a lot on on that, on, on Shaduchim. And um, if I can just say, you know, I think something important is because you mentioned right now, you, you know, you may be self-conscious how you're sitting, how you're coming across and so on. The job of the first date, tell people, is just to get to a second date. Focus on making the other person feel good. Because imagine if both people did that, they both come across great. But when you're eye focused, you're going to be self-conscious first off, right? Whether it's a speech or on a date, you focus on the self, you're literally conscious of the self. Every gesture you make, you don't even know what to do with your hands, every word, you can be analyzing, you're going to have that narrative going in the background. Oh, I just said that. I wonder if she picked up on that. You know what that's that? Forget about that. Just your only voter, your only job is to help that other person have a great time and to focus on them. Afterwards, you can decide if they were right for you. And you'll have a much better date, but obviously more goes into this. That's a phenomenal dance. like mindset to have when dating. I, I, I dated and think I'm married now, but I never looked at it like that. Like go on this date and make that person feel comfortable and don't judge. You don't have to figure them out or they don't have to figure you out. Just make them feel comfortable. Sure. What, what happens? You go out with somebody and it's like, oh my gosh, she didn't say please to the waitress. How is he going to treat our kids? And what about our guy? <laughs> you know, and they're off and running, you know, 80 years into the future. You know, and it's same thing in, you know, personal conversations. Some people aren't good at, you know, small talk talk, and, you know, the uh, casual interactions. I say, you know, you're trying to impress the other person. Just have in your mind that you're going to leave this conversation with that person feeling better about themselves. So you'll talk about them. You'll ask them questions, not in an inauthentic way, not in a flattery way, certainly. You can't do that. But in a genuine, honest, open way, and you're going, to, you're going to come across so much better because again, you're not eye focused. We'll be right back to this episode in just a second. But first, a quick word from our friends at, yes, by the way, they're back. The Dream Raffle. Who's excited? Who's excited? First of all, every single ticket that's purchased this year for the Dream Raffle is going to support the farmers and those in the border of Gaza. Uh, it's so important to support Israel during these challenging times. But now more than ever, I personally have been feeling that, you know what? It really might be time. It might be time to think seriously about moving to Israel. I know people who did it. And uh, you know what makes that a little bit easier? Not not much easier, but a little bit easier is probably winning a $1 million apartment in the heart of Yerushalayim. And that can happen through the Dream Raffle. So you got to go to the dreamraffle.com. Make sure you buy your tickets. You can use promo code MPP. Use promo code MPP and you'll get a special deal, some extra tickets, some better pricing. But you got to be in it to win it. And you're winning no matter what, when you buy a ticket to the dream raffle, because you're supporting a great cause. And you know what, when they do that drawing, you want to have the possibility of hearing your name called pack up that family and go there. 
and go live there. That's what it's about. Or if you don't want to, which is erroneous, you can also take the cash alternative, I think, but who doesn't want to live there? Anyways, go to thedreamraffle.com, get your tickets today, and I hope to hear your name called. Enjoy the rest of the episode. You, you've spoken to thousands of people, and I'm sure you counseled, you know, privately thousands more in this area of of dating and shidduchim and relationships. Just speaking, I guess, right now about um, shidduchim, and we're going to get to chinuch and anger and all that stuff, which is all really into the same same pie. Sure. But speaking shidduchim specifically, what have you seen over the last few years in the from world um, in regards to shidduchim? You know, what could we be doing better? Is it a per- personal person on person basis that needs to improve? Uh, is there really not enough girls to boys or is that like, what do you think? Uh, it's a good question. Um, specifically speaking, I think some people, first off, I think having a, a, a responsible dating coach is very, very valuable because if you're going out and you're sort of, you know, making the same mistakes that just don't get you out of the gate or you're not focused on the right things, it's going to hang people up. And there are some really phenomenal dating coaches, obviously, certainly many to stay away from, but there are some really, really good ones. So I would say if you're, if you're not Matzliak, if you're not successful, meaning you're not married or you're, you're, you don't, you, you feel like it's, uh, you're not able to get out of the gate and, and have an effective connection, work with somebody, speak with somebody, because it is hard. I mean, if you think about, you know, you're, for a lot of people, you're uh, being in, in a dynamic where you're speaking to a boy or girl for the first time in this way, uh, and it's very unsettling. But I think really to to answer your question is, I think more effective communication, being able to carry a conversation uh, in a genuine, honest way, and also just, you know, physically to present yourself. But I've seen people make the same mistake when I speak on this. I say, you know what, you know, some people, they can't understand why they're not getting married, but on the first date, they'll tell the person every medication they're on, every therapist they've been to, every issue that they have. And they'll say, you know what? If they don't know the real me, then I don't want to marry them. It's like, you know, let them get to know the whole you. It's like going on a job interview and saying, you know, I like to sleep late on Mondays. I'm going to be out on Fridays. You know, you want to lead with the positive. That's, it's not Ganevistas. It's just being smart. So sometimes, again, we do things that hang ourselves up. And if you just have somebody that could say, you know what, maybe try this or maybe don't do that, I, I think we'll have a lot more success. Just again, on a specific person to person basis. Yeah, I want to highlight the point that you're making. Um, you stated it very concisely, but I think people are very committed to being real and being authentic and being honest about who they are. And a person is very aware of their own defects. And when they're conscious of those defects, they already future trip and anticipated getting in the way of, you know, being able to get married. So they sort of shelter themselves from that pain of, I don't want to get to know this person too well, because then when this thing becomes revealed, oh, then it's going to be a deal breaker. And let me get this out of the way now. Right. And I think it's very empowering the perspective that you're offering, which is, I mean, in general, I always find it helpful to shine the light of, it's bashert. The two parts of a, of, a, of a soul are put down into this world and it's their job to find each other. And the same way uh, a girl in Shaduchim is looking for that guy, the guy in Shaduchim is looking for her. And I've spoken to people that are still in the middle of their journey of looking for a Shaduch and sharing with a lot of pain that... I have such a hard time and I don't know what to do. And what I find to be very comforting to that person is that the person on the other side of that equation is experiencing a very similar thing right now. Yeah. 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 And it's very empowering to know that, like you said, they need to get to know the entire you. Right. Not just, not just that thing that you're afraid to share. Right. That's a beautiful point. I'd say two things on that. One is that, you know, right. Well, you said, you know, a, we're all aware of our defects. I'd say a healthy person is aware of their deficiencies and insecurities. You know, there are plenty of people who, you know, have no idea of their shortcomings and that's obviously not the healthiest place to be. So it's a good thing that we're aware of our, you know, our uh, deficiencies, which we all have. I mean, you, not me. Um, <laughs> right. So, so that's one of the second thing is, you know, in order to connect, it requires being vulnerable, right? I have to risk experiencing the pain of rejection in order to have this connection. And, regrettably, and just to go deeper than, you know, before is that, you know, that's what is going to hang up a lot of people. And just what you said, in other words, if they know the real me, 
the true me, they're not going to love me. They're going to reject me. So if you have somebody with whether it's abandonment issues or any sort of, you know, deep seated insecurities or feelings of inferiority, they are going to run at anything that begins to smell like it's going well, mm. which again, which is why a good dating coach, you know, maybe even a therapist, I guess, in some instances, if, you know, you're talking about more deeply rooted issues. And again, you know, the, as you said, the person sitting across from you is as scared as you are. You know, people often, I speak to people, you know, they say, I've got this, you know, this medication or this, you know, uh, mental, emotional disorder or this physical thing. I said, trust me, when you share with them, you're going to hear something back, <laughs> you know, and if, and if not, then just wait two minutes. You know, everyone's got something. And if you knew just how scared that person was, just how anxious they were and afraid and insecure, you would feel much more confident. But again, that's what it means to focus on the eye is you're not able to focus in on them. And when you're eye centered or egocentric, uh, you're going to be hypersensitive to all of your insecurities and you're not going to connect. And at the same time, maybe that's not a conversation for your first date. Yes. There is a time yeah. and place for everything. Like you said, first date is make them feel comfortable. Yeah, right. I heard it once as, as a muscle actually to people take on certain humras during certain times of the year. For example, that Sarasim Mechuva, right? So people will eat, um, if they're not uh, makbid throughout the year, they'll eat only Chal Yisrael during the Sarasim Mechuva. And the question is, uh, right after Yom Kippur, you're going back to- Who are you fooling? Yeah, who are you fooling? You're going right back to, to Dunkin' Donuts, to- the Baskin Robbins. So what's uh, Hagen does? I give a few more Michelle. Carvel, any more? You got one, Dave? Right. So what's what's the Cal Stam references? Come on. <laughs> yeah, you got your kids in school. I'm no, sorry. No. <laughs> so what's the what, like? What is this show? And I heard once a very nice explanation. When a person goes to a wedding, what do they do? They dress. They get dressed and they put on makeup and they present themselves a certain way at a wedding or on a first date. Does a person does does a guy wear a tie during the week? Does a guy dress like that on his first date? Does a girl do her hair and makeup in the way that she does on her first date? No, not necessarily. But that's the way you show up to your first date, and that's the way you show up to the Eberster during the Sarasi Mechuva. So it, it it is it is okay to present your best self, your whole self, at a certain time, and then as you get to know someone and as you connect with someone, then the 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 real you and the further layers of you can reveal themselves. Very can nice. I push back on that though for a sec? Like, yeah? Yes. Okay. You guys need the room. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, like not push back, but I'm saying like, but that might lead to the, the unnatural um, aspect of dating in the firm world, which is like, you're just trying to get to know somebody yet you're wearing things and, and getting all dressed up in a very, I guess, intense manner that one, one of which you're not used to. Whereas if you're generally someone that likes dressing casual, wearing a sweatshirt, nice pair of pants and shoes, go grab a coffee with this person and, and, and her the same, you know, like I'm just shooting, like saying all that, like maybe that adds a little bit of a unnecessary intensity to dating. Right. But there are social norms and protocols. I know so. what social norm is. I mean, when you're meeting somebody like you're wearing a jacket and a sweater and I'm, I, I think I'm dressed socially acceptable for what we're doing right now. Right. But this is not socially acceptable to go on a date with right. the first date. Sure. If I were to come in a suit and tie and did my hair and makeup right now, that wouldn't be socially nor acceptable for this conversation. Okay. But why is it for a first date with somebody you've never met that you're trying to get to know better? Well, is that a genuine question? Yeah. Mo, Momo, you want to take them? So I, I think that the social norms, and there are different circles. There are some circles where you show up in a suit and a tie and a yeah. hat. And that's that has a certain social norm. But who created and that that's not norm? that's not unnatural. Well, it's very if, natural. If you're a casual guy and you're applying for a job, as you know, as a law firm, you're not showing up in jeans and and uh, and, a, and a t-shirt, even though you're a casual guy. You want to convey that because there are social norms. And by the way, a breach in social norms is a red flag. Quite frankly, not for you, just generally speaking. <laughs> um, and. I should have worn a more. Well, it depends <laughs> what kind of insurance you have, and you know, maybe we'll deal with it. Yeah. Um, no, I know it's a breach in social norms. There are certain things that are accepted and acceptable, and and when a person doesn't follow that, it, it's a red flag. But why are we? But why? Oh, that's a she, different question. You're asking a legitimate question. Yeah, but why? But why should Duchim fall into that category of job interview? That's very. That's a very, job interviews are scary. Yes, they're scary. Okay. Why does, why does, you know, something as exciting as finding your potential spouse need to be that way? So on the question, do you think that a young lady should not wear makeup on a date, on a first date? 
<laughs> no comment. I'm going to get canceled. Um, should, let, ask me a different question. <laughs> I, do you think a guy shouldn't, you know, tuck his shirt in and 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 wear what's yeah, no looking like a mensch? Looking yeah. like a mensch, I think, is always got to look like a mensch. You know, respectable. Okay, let me ask you a different question. Do you think somebody dated dating in Lakewood circles where I live, or someone dating in the five towns, that they might go on the first date dressed differently with different expectations? Yeah, that's social norm. I understand that. I, I understand what I'm what I'm asking is I'm not, and I agree it's a social norm, and I did the same. And I'm not saying anyone should do it. It should do it differently. But what I'm asking you is, does that add a level of, uh, you know, it pressure. being, yeah, pressure and, and it not adds natural. gravity to the encounter. Yeah. Which it's, is it's why a first probably date. you're so wait, wait. busy with people who are dating because it adds a level of pressure for them that is not comfortable. I, 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 I hear the question. I'm just not sure how wearing certain clothing it becomes more pressurized. I could see somebody saying that they feel more comfortable. I knew a guy, by the way, great guy. He had the the flu one day and we were signing contracts in his house. He comes down in a suit and a tie. I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, I can't think unless I'm, this is what I'm wearing. So there, I think there is what to say for treating with a degree of dignity, degree of respect. I mean, you're meeting somebody who also presumably, I hear the question, by the way, there was, if you're saying dressing a certain way uh, is going to add to the gravity of the first date, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I hear that. You, you, you hear what I'm saying. I, I do, but at the same time, I, I think it's important to respect, Add that gravity. Yeah. Yeah, to respect the process. Meaning that, you know, if this is something that is, um, that first off, that there are plenty of people, why did the social norms develop in the first place is because you want to get a sense for what kind of person this is. And we do live in a, just human nature, we judge people based on external, externalities. That's no surprise. You didn't, why didn't you show up in your, in your pajamas? I wish I would. I wish I could. I'm kidding. Um, no, I actually love saying my pajamas, but I didn't because this is an interview and I'm at work. And right. So, so, so you decided that, okay, fine. Wearing a you know, black knit shirt is fine, but pajamas aren't. And woven, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, there's, and there's, who developed? Wh wh how did you come to that determination? I guess it's, like it's a fashion choice. No, like not from where I'm sitting. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> again, I, I think I think people feel good yeah. when they dress a certain way, and there are you know fifth, sixth date is you know maybe casual date where you do something a little bit more loose, a little more easy. But I, what's the psychology behind that though? As the date gets more and more because, further down, they because, get more comfortable well, dressing. That's just it. You you do want to uh, expose the other person to different facets of you, uh -huh. particularly if you're not always, you know, maybe clicking on the, the formal one. But again, find me somebody who's not more comfortable dressing like a mensch, because I do think they will be able to conduct themselves in a way. So again, I, you, your okay. question on how, why social norms develop this way, I think it allows for us to optimize our presentation of how we're coming across. That's a great answer. I, I That makes sense to me. Okay. And I'm not... Yeah, yeah, Momo. <laughs> no, no, I think we, I think we co covered this topic thoroughly. Yes, and I want to just pivot within it, and something that you mentioned, but I want to call more attention to it, which is the skills of today's generation of interacting because of how much time we spend on our phones and typing and yeah. texting and interacting without interpersonal skills right, that right, are necessary. Right, I'm wondering as you're guiding people in Shaduchim, and I think I'd like to expand the lens beyond that to sibling relationships and parent and child relationships, where, where are you seeing this compromise to the skills that we are lacking because we're not interacting in person as much? And where can we grow in that regard? It's good because I think it's just emotionally, it's devastating for some people because you think you're connecting, you're isolated. The relationships you have, the interactions you have are surface. You know, texting somebody is not a relationship. We think it is. Having a friend on Facebook is not a relationship. We think it is. So we're experiencing these surface um, uh, relationships and, and communication, but there's no depth. And because of that, we don't feel really connected. You don't feel connected. You feel isolated. So from an emotional and mental health standpoint, it's very injurious, very injurious. And now certainly a relationship is only as solid or healthy as the people in it. So if you have one or both people who are less emotionally solvent, then the relationship isn't going to be ideal. And also communication is going to break down. You know, it's try sarcasm in a text. It doesn't matter how many emojis you use, that conversation may very well break down. And the ability to be able to- I've been advocating for a sarcastic font, by the way, for a long time now. Oh, that's very- Maybe italics? Be a, Use italics? But it's unclear. 
It's ambiguous. Sarcastic we need to font. all agree to a sarcastic font. Research shows after five interactions back and forth, conversations by text typically break down. Meaning five, five, five back and forths, meaning that if you're trying to get your point across, it ends being, it, it devolves into something much less productive. Pick up the phone. Yeah, exactly. Call right. them. Right. Right. I hate phone calls. You are pro- you're are part you, of the problem. I, <laughs> I, no, I, I, I'm not part of the problem. I have the problem. <laughs> you're, you're, a bi- you're a big introvert, are you? Yeah. Yeah. I can't call people. I know. How do you not know? Only that, you, probably, you probably text to see if it's a good time to call, right? You don't just call or you don't just text. Yeah. Will you just pick up the phone and call if you need to? No, you know, I can't do cold calls. Yeah. I can't do cold so calls. So wait, do you just I'm read that s- on me? I'm enjoying this so much right now. You read that? Like, I, by the way, first of all, no one, like people who meet me, like they don't, they can't believe I'm an introvert because of what I do. Right. But like, there's nothing more um, scary than a room full of people. So yeah, I get that. I, I, I love people though. <laughs> <laughs> You're not anti Not to say like, no, I love dogs a lot more. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not, I'm maybe antisocial a little bit. I don't know. What do you think? I, what do I think? I'm also uh, an introvert. Oh, yeah? So I get it. Yeah. So how does that work for you? Because you have to speak in front of throughout right. a year, probably tens of thousands of people. Right. So it, it, it's not my uh, vocation. I stumbled into it. There's absolutely, there are pl- plenty of speakers and, and you know, you, we, we know them, but they live for that energy. I don't. Um, yeah, I, I like exhausting, huh? Yeah. It, 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 there are times when, you know, you're, you're, you're in the groove and you're affecting a positive change and there's an energy that is, is indescribably um, exciting for sure. But those are few and far between. I mean, my nature by itself is, is an, as a writer, that's why I've written. And I really stumbled into the whole speaking thing. Um, but by nature, it's, I, it doesn't get me going and I'm, I'm not uh, enthused by a crowd or speaking or having the spotlight. Well, how do you give yourself the, I guess, the permission to do that internally, you know, to, to move away from the, the pen and, and the laptop and get in front of people. I imagine it's something that's, you know, again, you mentioned it's outside your comfort zone. Yeah, sure. Well, that's growth. I mean, you know, that, that's, you know, that, that's what we're here and for. That's something that that's, I guess that's what led to your decision to be like, yeah, I want to do it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, again, I really stumbled into it. Someone asked me to speak and I spoke and it went, you know, pretty good. And I started speaking and, and, I, at one point I taught public speaking. So, you know, I, I only taught it because I've done everything wrong that you can as a public speaker. So I learned what not to do. What was like the biggest no-no you did and you've done in public speaking in your, in your career? I continue to do it. And that is, I, I tell people, slow it down. Mm-hmm. And when I start, I'm thinking faster. And I, more than a few people have asked me after a speech, you know, how I work on my stutter. And I don't stutter in <laughs> real life. Because I mumble and jumble and my words and I speak so quickly, it sounds like I have a stutter sometimes, but I don't. So that's, you know, one of the things just public speaking 101 is slow it down. And uh, I, I can't even take my own advice. I have to remind myself to do that. So I don't. I don't Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. We'll be right back to this episode, but first a word from our friends at Town Appliance. So it's winter coming and it's time for those special prices. You go to townappliance.com and you're like, okay. Oh, what can we do here? Okay, so let's say I'm on there. I see a microwave. Usually it's going for 350. Get it for 197 right now. Boom. Save 150 bucks. Maybe you need a refrigerator, a freezer, fridge on top stacked. The list price thousand dollars. Town appliance says, nah, we got you. Six seventy nine. You save thirty eight percent. Now is the time. Washer dryer. I know somebody that this week they called the town appliance. They need a new washer dryer. They're having issues. Boom. Town appliance comes through for the win. Hooked it up, got it all going. It was an amazing, amazing move. Ever since 1979, Town Appliance has been the number one go-to place for you when it comes to appliances. So head to townappliance.com or go ahead, hit the link in the description of the show notes of this episode and message them on WhatsApp. How simple is that? Get the amazing savings that you need and deal with the people that understand what you need as well. That happens when you deal with townappliance.com. Um, what, what, one of the titles of the book sitting in front of me right now is Never Get Angry Again, Yeah, which is like... I'm in the. Can we meet- stay on something before never getting angry? Totally. I want to stay on empowering people. It doesn't have to be Nahi specifically, but empowering As people I unfolded my arms. to pick up the phone. Yeah. Because we, in our conversation, we sort of took for granted that it's injurious and that people are compromising their, their skills right. of communication. Right. I want to develop that, that notion a little bit to help people understand the value of in-person communication, whether it's on the phone or in person, but real-time communication. 
Why is that so important to our communication skills? Well, very nice the way that you, you know, you phrase it. You're, I'm assuming, a raging extrovert, yeah? So, <laughs> you know, you f- you're framing the question. Raging, like, like leading hey. question. <laughs> no, you're, ra- you're framing the question like, of course, you know, this is the right mahalak is to go ahead and to gauge and per, you know, who says? Because that's who you are? I mean, No, I you said be... it's injurious, so I'm inviting well, no, you to no, elaborate it's, on it's, that. It's injurious to confine ourselves to our nature. Our job is to rise above our nature. But just because it's your nature, that doesn't mean that's the winning side. Fair. Yeah. Raging extrovert. So, I, for example, by the way, perhaps there are times I might respectfully suggest that you would benefit from a conversation not taking place in person because you're too passionate, too, uh, yeah, over maybe um, excited and might not be able to contain yourself. And you're better off with a measured, responsible text or written correspondence and you can't help yourself. Am I wrong about that? Send a letter, you animal. I'm open to the <laughs> feedback. <laughs> I'm open for the feedback and a lot of potential. Yeah. So you, what, you're, what, you're, what you're saying is whatever you are, try doing the opposite. But uh, again, I'm not here to tell anyone what they should or shouldn't be doing. You kind of are. You're the, you're the right, doctor. Right. So, so <laughs> I, I'm suggesting is that, you know, our job is to rise above our nature, is, is to not confine ourselves to our personality and it's to expand on it. So if it's our nature to be introverted, quite possibly, it might be much the same way like in a relationship with somebody and you know that you have a people pleaser, that perpetual doormat, and they're in a relationship continually with somebody who is very aggressive, very assertive. And so you know, 99 out of 100 times, their voda is to stand up for themselves and to learn how to speak up and to draw that boundary and, and to be comfortable with that. And that will allow them to expand their uh, personality. There are people who are very aggressive, very assertive, very, you know, in your face in a reckless way and go into other people's boundaries. Their job is to pull it back, right? And, and, and that is, you know, the epitome of mental health is to have that balance and that sort of lean into our nature. But in one's defense, well, well, I mean, we are mentioning the whole texting thing, how five interactions, it kind of goes off the rails. Right. In oh, a way. no, no, I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm asking why he, he, he framed the question as if you know, this is, you know, the right Mahalach and, and Nahi doesn't have it right. Right. Yeah. So no, I, I wasn't, I wasn't saying anything. It's because he's a raging yeah. extrovert. Yeah. So I, I, I happen to agree. I love I, that. I, Can we I, name I, that the episode? Raging extrovert, Momo Bauman? I object. <laughs> Permission to treat the witness as hostile, Your Honor. <laughs> um, I, I don't disagree. Certainly, yes, it would be good for Nahi to be able to. And by the way, here's the litmus test. After you make the phone call, and it goes, you know, pretty well and you don't overanalyze it and say, oh, I should have said this, 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 whatever. Do you feel better that you made it or less good? I don't, I see, I don't know if the phone call thing is coming from a place of, um, it's a waste of time. This could have been, you know, boom, boom, t- couple of texts back and forth. And right. just the phone call is just unnecessary. Sure. Or if it's, um, just don't want to. I think it comes like, let's say like this, right? Let's say I'm, I'm calling a potential donor, right? right. Yeah. Uh, you know, asking for. That's scary to me. Sure. I, even though it's it's unconventional and it's it's I borderline frowned upon. You don't text somebody asking them for something. I would, and yet you do. <laughs> yeah, you know, like the amount of the amount of money I've raised texting people yeah. <laughs> and not calling. I don't even know who people exist. No, um, but like that's that's where it lies. It's a scary thing, um, probably because of confrontation or just put. It's very vulnerable to get on the phone and and sure you can't control. Right. What's the, happening? Yeah, you can't control that. That's why public speaking, why is it easier for us to have a conversation one-on-one or two-on-one? And probably less so, you probably get people here who are, are mama shaking, yeah? yeah. Because, because it's, it, it, I get it. It, 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 any reasonable person would, it's unsettling to have cameras on, you know, something's going on, the perpetuity. It's, if you think about it, it is unsettling. So the reason why we have a hard time speaking in public is because you can't manage your image, how you're coming across one-on-one, what's the most damage you could possibly do to the person, you know, and you can better modulate it and, uh, you know, gauge where they're holding, if you're losing, if they're interested and so on. If you're speaking to an audience, you don't know what they're thinking, what they're doing. So you can't control the narrative as well as you can with the text. You can control everything that you're texting and everything that you're texting back to. Which is probably the downfall because you're not giving much over of your personality. It's very measured. Yeah, sure. Right, exactly. Like, but, let's say you're dating somebody. Yeah. Texting. Right. Like, let's say you dropped a shot in. The texting, yeah, yeah, probably not so great. I, I don't think it's advisable in most cases. No, is that things can go bad very quickly. Have you seen that? Like, yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> yeah, they, they go bad. <laughs> they mamish go bad. 
they go bad, they go bad, they go bad because- Or if know, they stay on their four and three, and five and three. Do they go bad yeah. though, is the question. Part of me? <laughs> do they go bad though? Because oh, I only said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, asking good. I, no, not necessarily. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they, they, it, it's it also because you don't know somebody's style. In other words, you know, we have all different communication styles, right? We certainly see this, you know, with Shalom bias issues. You know, one person grows up in a home where, you know what, if, if someone was angry with the other person, they would just, you know, storm out, cool down, and they'd revisit the conversation in an hour. Somebody else, you sit there and fight it out. Both people get married. You know, someone's off and running, closing the door. It's like, hey, wait, we're supposed to, all right? So, you know, you're texting somebody who you really don't know. You don't know the style. You don't know what gets, certainly sarcasm is a problem. You don't know enough. Um, and there's just too many pitfalls. I totally hear you. Mo moving on to anger. Because um, that probably also coincides with Sean Bias, right? Yeah, sure. Um, the foolproof way to stay calm and, and control any conversation or situation. So especially nowadays where it seems like there's not a lot of nuance for sure in the, in the political realm. Right. Um, did yeah. I, did I, no, no, I was just reading the sub. That's cool. Oh. New York times bestselling author of get anyone to do anything. And never be lied to again. So I, I gave you these books. because I, I don't recommend read all them? of my books. No, no, no these are, <laughs> but I, I, I don't, I mean, some of them, you know, they're, they're looking back they're They're, they're not, they're not brilliant pieces of literature. Uh, but these, I think, are my two best sort of mainstream titles. They're the last two books I've written. Mind Reader came out just uh, last year and Never Be Lied To, uh, Never Get Angry Again uh, a couple of years before that. Um, Can someone really actually never get angry again? So I, 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 I have gotten the most amazing, beautiful feedback from people on this. Is it, do, are, do they never get angry? I don't know. But I can tell you that people have uh, been able to transform the quality of their lives. And when you do, you know, you contain your anger, you're going to change the quality of your relationships. I, I'm yeah. going to get this for Hanukkah for some people. It might be insulting though. <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear that. Yeah. Imagine. I got you a good. book. It's really good. I highly recommend it's it. It's like, calm yeah. down, please. <laughs> um, what What are some, I guess, tips for, you know, like, like I, like I prefaced nowadays, there's, um, opinions and many, many times you're on the out you're, And this happened by the way, over the last few years, especially with let's say COVID there's the right. uh, mass people, not mass people, vax right. people, not vax people. Right. And now politically there's uh, the Israel, even within the from world, sure, there's the sure. support Israel, go to the rally. Then there's the don't go to the rally, whatever. Right. Right. How do you not stay angry? How, how do you not get angry? How do you stay calm? Good, good, good. So th there's, there's a lot to unpack there, but first is that the apex of emotional health is to recognize that people have different perspectives. It doesn't mean right and wrong. It just means that you see things differently. And in the healthiest relationship, and certainly with the healthiest person, you recognize that even though you see one thing, I see something else, it doesn't make one of us bad. And there was the old days when we disagreed politically, um, it was, you know, we, we would see things differently. I see one thing, you see the other, but we'd still conduct ourselves cordially. And then this is a reflection of society at large too. And then it sort of shifted to, it's not just uh, our perspective, but I'm right and you're wrong. And then right now we're at, it's not just I'm right and you're wrong, but I'm good and you're bad, right? Mm. Meaning if you hold this opinion, then you're not a good person, right? Which is, you know, maybe there are some opinions that we could say this person is morally bankrupt, but, you know, the ability to be able to recognize that you know, I see things one way, you see them a different way. It doesn't necessarily mean that one of us is good or bad and certainly not right or wrong which comes a lot into validation and, you know, in relationships and, you know, this comes up in any interpersonal relationship. Very often we don't want to validate because I don't want to give into the mishigash, give into the craziness and say, you know what, I'm validating a perspective that's, that's crazy or I'm enabling it, big buzzword. But it, uh, validation has nothing to do with right and wrong or the facts. Validation simply means is I get why you're in pain based on your perspective. Right? A small child comes to you, your kid comes to you because this car broke. Are you really going to tell them that it's just a toy car? What are you making a big deal about it? Right? Because the mindset is, you know, your real car breaks, you'll get upset. Do you want someone coming to you and say, Momo, come on, it's just a car? You know, if you've got a healthier perspective, you recognize it is just a car. But in the moment, to you, it's very important. So uh, being able to validate just means that you're acknowledging this person's experience. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to save you. 2195 in terms of <laughs> anger and you ask for tips. So first off, it's to recognize that people have different perspectives, but easier said than done. The genesis of anger is going to be fear. When we become scared, we're going to become angry. There's, we, there's not a situation where we become, where you trip over a chair or someone disagrees with something you say, what happens is that you know, in a conversation with somebody, they don't see things your way. 
I get angry. It's, it's counterproductive, right? No one ever walked away from a conversation and said, I wish I would have gotten angrier. I would have been able to handle myself so much better, right? It clouds our ability to see clearly. It, it inhibits our objectivity and rationality. So what happens is the reason we become angry is because we're scared. Now, rather than feel that fear, anger serves as a mask because fear, being scared, is very unsettling. But you become angry. You've got neurotransmitters, hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, everything surging through. It masks and channels away that feeling of vulnerability into a feeling of power. But that's the eights of horror. That's the ego. The truth is, which with each anger-driven moment, we become less in control and more scared. So, you know, uh, Shlomo HaMelech says, the English is that anger rests in the bosom of fools. So a person who's angry always has it ready here to unload. So I think one fabulous technique, something that I've done myself, is to take anger off the table completely. Meaning that in any situation, if you're going to take anger and you keep it here, ready to pull out when it's warranted, you pull it out at the wrong times because when your ego's engaged, perspective narrows, you don't see clearly. But if you take it off the table completely, it's not like you're benching and the kids are doing something. There's only times you can say, no, 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 before you're no longer benching, right? So you pretend like there's no way that you can interact with this person because here's the thing. There's no tachacha, there's no um, advice, there's no chinek that you can give over in a way that's not calm that will be effective. If you can't say it calmly, then you're going to be ineffective. So don't say it at all. Wait until you have your moment. Is it possible one in a billion times your moment will pass or you should have gotten angry? And Rambam explains there's certain times it's warranted and so on, external display. There are caveats there. But if you take it off the table completely, you're going to find that you just unable to pull out that quill. And over time, it becomes your second nature. It's, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal technique. Well, is there ever a time when someone should get angry? Because the title is never get angry again, yeah. but there are some things yeah. that are incredulous. Right. So... It, so yeah, I mean, the Rambam talks about times where it's necessary to become angry, not just display anger. Your child runs into the street. You, yes, you want to display anger, but there are times when you should manifest anger. But those are few and far between. And also this happens to be a mainstream book. It's not, if it were a book written for, you know, the Jewish market, I would have put in those qualifications. That's it's very interesting. But I, that really talks about, you know, let's say myself taking anger off the table, but Right. But what can you do about the person you're sitting across from when they have anger on the table? How do you converse with somebody Good. who um, is angry and is always angry? In the Excellent. face of anger. Great. I'll tell you what doesn't work. We'll start with that. Sure. Never say, calm down. Hmm. Right? Darn. How, how, how well does that work for you? You're married, right? right? <laughs> In other words, no one ever said to you, you know, calm down or don't worry. And you go, oh, I feel so much better, right? Because what happens? You tell someone to calm down. If you understand that the genesis of anger is fear, loss of control, now you're telling them exactly how to feel. You want to take away their last vestige of power by telling them how to feel and calm down. That's why it's not productive. What you want to do, two, th two things. Number one is empathize. Empathy is not sympathy. Empathy is your pain is my pain. If someone's upset, keep your mouth closed and just have your non-physical reflecting back congruent with their pain. It's very cathartic. What does know? that mean? Meaning that if they are, you know, you have a conversation with somebody and you're talking about something that's really uh, troubling you, very upsetting, and they're like, oh, Anachi, that really seems like I'll talk. You're like, they're just, you know, they're just missing it, right? Yeah, so, every day. <laughs> yeah, okay, right. <laughs> He's got a lot to, lots to add, I'm, I'm sure here. Yeah, got I'm your book that. for He's pointing to miss it, not to me, by the way. <laughs> yeah. For anyone that's listening. Um, He's a redhead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Given into the stereotypes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Leaning in, leaning in. Leaning in. Um, so, yeah, you want to be able to express how they're feeling in your novel. So, uh, so what does it mean? It means if they're in pain, you're, you have that consternation, that, that, that sadness on your face too. It has to be congruent. And then validation, again, validation doesn't mean, you know, we, we jump in with solutions or we try to minimize, which is even worse. We say, you're making a big deal out of nothing. Rather than establish connection through validation by letting them know you understand their pain, you minimize it. And that's what we so often do in, with our spouse, with our children. They're going through something. Oh, it's not a big deal. That's not what they want to hear. Now, it may not be a big deal, and you want to offer them an alternate perspective, but there's no way you're going to get them to take off their glasses and put on yours and see more clearly while they're holding tightly to theirs. They're only going to hold tightly to theirs while they're defending their position. The minute Momo, I tell you, you know what? I understand why this is so painful for you. 
You let down your shield. Okay, great. I don't have to sell them anymore. Now I can move in and I can help you to look at things differently. But up until the point I'm arguing with you, you're defending your position. Make sense? Mm -hmm. It makes a lot of sense. But how do you do that without sounding, I guess, superficial? Like right. someone's like, oh, I'm so upset. This is, yeah. this person just like, let's say something that you, you don't like really you want to say is calm down, right? right. It's because right. you're not really right. vibing with it. Good. Like this person coming off. Oh my gosh, no way. That's so not nice of them. Uh, that sounds really like. Well, if you sound like a valley girl, maybe, but <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure. You're like a what? A valley girl. You're like, oh, yeah. oh my gosh. You're from I, the valley, no? I'm not. Oh, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I do. Yeah. So if you're going to sound like this, it's going to be inauthentic. Uh, but put it, but how are you supposed to sound when it's something you. you don't really Excellent. care about? Because there are times when you are angry about something that deep down inside, you know, is absolutely ridiculous. You're blowing out of proportion. You don't want your wife to give you the MS. You want her to say, Nahi, I could see this is difficult. Now she's not saying she agrees. But based on your perspective, if you had this experience, she can see, and it's not about being inauthentic. She's saying, I can see again, but if, if she walked through your lens, had your life, your experiences, your issues, your stuff, she would draw the same conclusion. So she's not saying, I agree, that would be inauthentic, right? We want to be definitely be authentic. But when you're in that space, it is counterproductive to tell the person what they're feeling is illegitimate. Mm -hmm. It's not real. I also find that when someone is so affected by the person that cuts them off or by the thing that when you hear it, you're like, really? What that typically means is that there's something Else. going on in their life or something that they're experiencing and that they're feeling that a simple cutoff on the road will trigger that and reveal pain that they're experiencing. And you can be sympathetic or empathetic rather to what's actually going on, whether they're sharing that with you right now or whether they're not. Yeah. Look, what, what, what happens? You know, anyone who's listened to my talks are going to roll their eyes when I give this example, because I'll put it in anywhere I can find. But the example that I always give is, you know, you're driving along, someone cuts you off on the road. What's going to bother you more? A little old lady driving like this, right? And the way to her own Leviah, or a young guy driving with a beer bottle on one hand, cigarette in the other. Right? Who's going to bother you more? The guy. Yeah. The guy, because we assume the little lady probably didn't see it. We don't take it personally. We assume the young guy did it to me on purpose. I'm going to save you, by the way, 25 years of therapy. Yeah, I know. You're thinking, where were you 25 years ago, right? But <laughs> something happens, you take it personally, you get upset. Something happens, you don't take it personally, you don't get upset. That's it, guys. That is, in a nutshell- Don't take it personal. You, 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 now, it's very easier said than done. We have to understand what part of us takes it personally. It's the it's a heart, it's the ego, it's a false self. There's a whole um, process to understanding. End of the day, that's going to be the end result. If I focus in on my pain rather than yours, I'm not able to empathize. Right. And I'm behind the eight ball. Of course, I'm going to get angry. We're in a conversation. You're mean, you're bombastic, you're yelling, you're, you're, you know, spewing a lot of stuff. If I'm focusing on my pain, I'm fighting against my own nature, not get upset. If I'm focusing on yours, right now, let me give you an example. Let's say that you had 100% perfect self-esteem, right? Per like, like, like me, right? <laughs> and you're in a conversation with somebody who's rude to you. What is your singular and sole thought? I feel bad for this person. Great. How much pain must this person be in to treat someone as amazing as me like this, right? Your focus isn't on yourself. You have complete empathy, connection. But as long as your eye focused, now what engages the ego, it's a lack of self-esteem. And again, that takes us into, you know, five hours. But Lamai said that is the end objective is to take the false self out of the way. Mm -hmm. The example I use, it's similar to your example with the car and the two drivers is if you're at a red light, for example, and your light turns green yeah. and you're ready to go. Yeah. And all of a sudden someone starts crossing right in front of you. Right. <laughs> and all of a sudden resentment is triggered, right? Yeah. What's, what's this guy doing walking yeah. in front of my car? I have a green light. Right. 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 And then you look a little closer and you notice that it's someone who is not well. Right. Right. And as soon as that compassion for that person, right. you don't hold it against that person that That's the person's right. crossing the light. They're unaware of what's going on. It's much easier to not take it personally and to not take it out on that person. That's right. So what happens? Let's take a step back. Just understand that dynamic. It's not what happens that gets us upset. It's the meaning we attach to it. And that meaning is based on how I feel about me. If this person's walking Oof. in front because they don't care about me, they don't respect me, they're on the phone, that, and so on, it's easier to get upset because you're ascribing a malevolent motivation. But if I recognize that somebody who's you know, I mean, handicapped or can't get by, or they're just emotionally unwell, I'm attaching a different meaning. So we assume it's because someone crosses in front of our car that that's why we're upset. It's not. 
In any interaction, any situation, you're not upset because of what the person does. You're upset because of the meaning you attach to it. You change the meaning, you're going to change your response. Wow. So it's like, this person is driving so slow in front of me. They don't value my time. It's I'm going to be late. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. You think that, right. That's incredible. Speaking of, of you know, just chinuch for a second, um, it dawned upon me that you grew up in Roslyn and, and now you live in Lakewood. <laughs> Yeah. What's, what's that like? Like, what's that? Uh... And we've been there 20 years. So, you know, all my kids pretty much, you know, have grown up there and it, it's fabulous. You know, you know, people are quick to, you know, put different communities into different categories. Mm -hmm. I love it. I think there's so much good there. Uh, there's so much beauty there. It's obviously, you know, different than Roslyn. It's different than a, a lot of places. Um, but there's an authenticity uh, with a, a lot of people. And, and I, I think it's uh, just extraordinary. Someone that you, you grew up near that I was speaking to you before we went on camera is Rabbi David Trank. Yeah. Anytime we have an opportunity to speak to speak of Rabbi Trank on this podcast. Gotta it's, take it. Gotta we gotta take we it. gotta we gotta take it. And I was mentioning briefly that the, the last time I visited Rabbi Trank, I actually brought him uh, the book that I that put out with Art Stroll, a meaningful minute book. I brought it to his house and obviously at that point he wasn't doing so well, but yeah. I went to visit him in the Rabbit's Inn. And after that I went to your house. <laughs> um you live on a big hill. Yeah. Yeah, front lawn is like your address is. Yeah, I was uh, going to say, you want to get my address? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, anyways, what, what's, uh, do you have any, any, any stories that are we never changed? So he was so extra. There was such an authenticity. I know you had. Speaking of never tonight. get angry, right? Oh my gosh, goodness. <laughs> I remember I was also, I was visiting him one time and I used to speak for his boys at the yeshiva and you know, he was, you know, two blocks away. And um, I remember uh, speaking one, one time, there's a story actually written up about where a boy had punched him several times in his mouth and he had a jaw wild, uh, wired shut and so on. He brought that boy to me right then. And his focus wasn't on himself. It was on just the boy should be okay and not feel bad. And he was like messed up. He oh, was bleeding. It was, it was, it was, it was I mean, he you know, came, walked down two blocks to, to my house and he's like, you know, he, we need some help, not him. He's not calling out Salah. He's focusing on the boy. But I remember speaking with this rabbit wow. the three of us are talking, my brother was there and uh, Rabbi Trank and um, she said, probably, I don't know if she told the story when she was here, but for the first, I don't know, 20 years of their marriage, she said she always thought that they had just the most amazing, great boys in the house. She didn't realize exactly, you know, where they were coming from. Or what the she, world thought of or them. Or what yeah. the world thought of them. Because he would always say, Leia, we're having an amazing boy. And so she said when they would come up and they'd ask for something, Milchuk, even though they had Fleshuk, she'd assume that they just forgot. It, was, she, it wasn't even for 20 years of marriage. And again, if I'm misquoting this, you know, uh, I'm sure she'll uh, let me know. Um, 20 years of marriage, again, and, and not because you can't do that if you're faking it and you really think one thing. He only saw the good. And as an extension of that, she only saw the good. And he was able to do things. I mean, he's told me story after story after story. There was one boy who was kicked out of yeshiva after yeshiva after yeshiva. And um, by him, every hour in the hour, he said, so-and-so, go run around the yeshiva. It could be rainy, it could be snowing, it could be a hundred, doesn't matter. He needed to get his energy. Today, I'm obviously not going to say who he is, where he is, but let's just say he's a very productive member of society that was kicked out of yeshiva after yeshiva after yeshiva. They just, he was just able to relate to these boys and only see the good. Wow. And I, th I think it's, uh, I think his kids, it, it even extended to his kids where people would talk about the kids at Adelphia and his kids would be like, they're talking about my father's Talmudim. Right. My father has the <laughs> best Talmudim. Like they didn't understand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, I, and I read the book, Just Love Them. And I yeah. interviewed Mrs. Robertson Trank and everything. Is it possible for someone to become like our way Trank? Is it possible to be like that? I'll quote the Rebbitson. He wasn't born this way. That's her exact words. And she said it on this because I watched it. She said he was, the word she was using was funny. She said he was born normal. <laughs> you know, she, you know, she, that's what she said. She, he, and I remember he, he was born like a regular and worked on himself to only see, like, imagine just the quality of relationship that you have. And also the quality of life that you have right. when you only see the good. It's it, it can be selfish because you move in a different space when you're only focused in on the good. He was the best. You think that's reachable? Absolutely. It's pretty incredible. It's a big avada. Yeah. yeah. What do you got? What are you working on now? I just finished a book on Betachen. Nice. That's different for you. Yeah. It's like a different realm. So, I mean, I've written on Bihira. Yeah. And, uh, free choice. Yeah. 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 So, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I haven't written on Batakan before. Sponsorship opportunities are available. How did that slip out? Family. Um, family. What's that? Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll hear it. Yeah. 
Uh, so yeah, I just finished a, a book I'm talking about. It's interesting. It doesn't have a single story, uh, not a single story. It's not a inspirational and motivation. It's all about the logic about how we acquire trust in Hashem. Hmm. How we like, how, how, like, like, the, like the gateway. In other words, what methodically the process to do it. And again, Badafka, not a single story. When's that coming out? It's like an instruction. Yeah. yeah awesome. Right, right, right. I mean, obviously well sourced with Chazal, but it's, it's not, uh, it's not inspiring insofar as motivational and story. It's inspiring, I think, because you have access to learn exactly what it is you need to do in order to achieve this level of tranquility, as, you know, Sharpet Talkin explains. Um, so it's like a, a, a roadmap. Uh, but it is, yeah. There's probably stories. no books on Bidach and I don't have stories. Right. Amir Tashem, this will be the, the, the first. And uh, so when is it coming out? Uh, right now it's uh, editing. So uh, I, I would like to think in four or five months. Incredible. Well, everyone can find that at their local Jodeca stores or on davidlieberman.com. Is that a thing? Uh, um, not yet. No, uh, no, I have a website, but I'm not even sure what it is. That's that's cool. Yeah. Just Google David Lieberman. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully, I mean, that's a pretty common name. Uh yeah, I uh I think there's a uh like a plastic surgeon or with that <laughs> same name, so I get some of his calls. Um <laughs> I don't know, I wonder how many of mine he gets. <laughs> <laughs> that's fascinating. Anyways, thank you so much for for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate your insight. You guys are mom is fantastic, really. Good thank you. Thank you. Up. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. Like I said in the beginning, go ahead, leave a comment on this video, and you'll be entered to win Dr. Lieberman's newest book, Never Get Angry Again, right? The foolproof way to stay calm and control in any conversation or a situation. That is from Dr. David Lieberman. It's actually not the newest book. That came out in 2018. He has a newer book, Mind Reader, uh, which pretty cool also you know what we'll raffle off one of each so we're gonna pick two winners in the comments go ahead never get angry again in mind reader leave a comment what you thought about the episode and you will be you might be selected to win a book I want to give a big thank you to our team here at meaningful people meaningful minute that made this episode possible our producer nissen gordon our executive editing staff naomi garfinkel Sorelli safless and Rufki markowitz our more editors and content creators, Bianca Kafash, and of course, our graphic designer, Yohavad Herzog. Thank you so much to our entire team for making this possible. And of course, you, the listener, thank you for listening to this episode. We appreciate and love each piece of your feedback. So leave a review in this episode. I go through each and every one of them. I promise you that. Or email me today at meaningfulpeoplepodcast.gmail.com. You can go ahead and email me personally, even at nachi at meaningfulminute.org. I do read emails that go to both of those accounts. Specifically, if you do want to advertise or sponsor any of these episodes, you can email us at MeaningfulPeoplePodcast at gmail.com. We have an amazing episode, more amazing episodes coming your way over the next couple of weeks. Stay tuned and follow our social media channels to see more about that. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you again next week.